Church, are you thankful to be here? Would you stand up and praise God with us this morning?
Welcome home, everyone. It is so good to be with you this morning here at First Mount Dora, and I want you to know you are all welcome. Well, what an incredible, incredible privilege I have here today. This is Ken and Julie, and I am so thankful to be their pastor and to get to know them. Two of our members, Rich and Diane, y'all wave, Rich and Diane, they invited... Ken and Julie to church here at their uh, community clubhouse. And they said, why don't you come on to church? Well, 10 days ago, they scheduled a time to get to know me, and we began to visit and talk. And, uh, and as we were talking, I talked to them about Jesus and that Jesus forgives us of all of our sins and that he makes us new. They both got down on their knees and prayed and asked Jesus to forgive them. And, and then here we are, here we are. And like many of you, they come from different backgrounds. First of all, they come from Illinois. Anybody in the house from Illinois? Yeah, a few of y'all from Illinois. So they come from Illinois. And uh, so they're very familiar with the Chicago and all of that kind of stuff. And Julie, in talking with her, had one of the most amazing backgrounds. I know a number of you in here do sign language. Julie's parents were deaf. And so she grew up doing sign language, and they went to the Episcopal church, her mother did, and Julie had to interpret the Episcopal messages, and she said that was quite a challenge. <laughs> quite a challenge. And, and so, and Ken grew up military family. His dad was a colonel, if I remember correctly. And Ken uh, had some Baptist background in there, but both of them know that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead, and is coming again. And they've trusted him as their savior. <laughs> and, you know, our, our backgrounds are wonderful and good and varied and everything, but our backgrounds, y'all know this, can never save us. It's whether or not we've prayed and asked Jesus to forgive us. And so Ken told me this morning, I was so excited about this, Ken said, I've waited all my life for this moment. And so what a great day. What a great day, church. Well, y'all know this water can never wash away what's on the inside, but Jesus commands us to be baptized. He tells us to be baptized, not for salvation, but for obedience. Are we really going to be surrendered? Are we willing to get wet for Jesus? You know, if we won't do it on the first thing, more than likely we'll never do it on anything that he ever asked us to do. And so Jesus said, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And here's the hard part. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's hard. Y'all know that, don't you? That's the hard part. And surely I am with you always. That's the promise even to the end of the age. So Ken, if you'll come on up here, I'm, I ask everybody this. Is it true that you've asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and you want to follow him all the days of your life? Yes, it is. Awesome. It gives me great privilege to baptize you, Ken William Ruffin. There we go. Ken William Ruffin, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. You did it, man. I did it. Julie Rose. Julie Rose Ruffin, in obedience to our Lord's commands, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. There you go. Well, church, let's pray, and then Scott's going to do our announcements. I am so grateful. You realize we're in a church that the abnormal is normal. What you see happening here week after week after week is not what's going on around the rest of the country. 
This is an amazing day in the house of the Lord, and you are seeing the Lord Jesus work and change lives. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you all the honor and the glory and the praise, for you're the only one who can change a heart. You're the only one who can bring us to repentance and help us to know, Lord, that we're not to live life for ourselves. We're to live it for you. You're the only one that helps us in every way to be surrendered. And so, Lord Jesus, now you work and you continue to move, even as we learn about all that's going on and all the blessings that you're doing. Lord, you bless. In Jesus' name, amen. Scott? Good morning. It's a great time to pause and be thankful, right, as we move into this week of Thanksgiving. Uh, we've been working with the kids uh, starting Wednesday night and again this morning. Actually, all month, our theme in kid worship has been to be grateful. We can all stand to be a little more grateful, right? Hope you're grateful this morning. I'm grateful for looking around and seeing people in this room, miracles, uh, and seeing people. It's good to stop and be grateful. By the way, did you know we have, we have a great church? You know that, right? We're grateful. Yeah, you should know that. If you're joining us for the first time today, would you do us a great favor? We are so grateful that you are here. Would you let us know that you are here? You can text the word welcome to that number right there, 352-704-1577. Just get out your phone and do that. That would be great. If you'd rather not do that in front of you in your pew, there is a connect card. You can fill that out. You can scan the QR code on there. If you're online, you're welcome to text us. Where are we at online? I'm looking for the camera right there. If you're online this morning joining us, uh, you can text that number as well. We can stay in touch with you that way. Let us know that you, that you are watching us online this morning. By the way, did you know we have one of the best drummers? <laughs> did you know that right over here? That's my son, Nate. Thanks, Nate. There is a lot going on in the life of our church. Be sure you take one of these cards. It says, what's next? To never miss a thing. It's at the Welcome Center. If you, have, if you don't have one of these stuck on your refrigerator, take one today, put it on your refrigerator, and then take one for your neighbor. We saw what happens when neighbors invite neighbors, right? As an evangelist for 25 years, as I traveled this amazing country and other parts of the world, the greatest challenge that we had was getting church people to invite their friends. So if you would just invite your friends, just invite them. Just let them know that they are loved and we would love to have them at church with you on a Sunday. It might just be as simple as giving them a card and say, hey, we'd love for you to join us over the next few weeks as we celebrate Christmas. So let them know. Let them know they're invited. And you can uh, let them experience the love here at First Mount Dora. Well, some of you came in this morning and you thought, are we moving? You are seeing an amazing blessing. So I want to read you some, just some numbers real quick here. We had several classes and groups of people get together to pack shoe boxes. If you don't know what's in these boxes, let me tell you really quick. This is uh, Samaritan's Purse, Operation Christmas Child. Each one of these boxes that you see is full of shoe boxes. You'll see them out front. And they've been packed to send around the world for a child to open at Christmas time not only to receive a gift of some kind, a toy, uh, some things to keep themselves clean, uh, clothes, maybe a shirt, something like that, but also the love of Christ by letting them know that they are loved. And some of these children that will open these boxes, this will be the greatest thing they, they do all year is to open that box. So listen to this. Mason's class, we have a life groups that have banded together. Mason's class packed 146 shoe boxes. That's awesome. Wednesday night at our WANA program, if you're not a part of that, we'd love for you to, you and your kids or grandkids be part of a WANA. We packed 60 on Wednesday night. That, you, that was good. Have you ever had 50 kids trying to show them how to pack a shoebox? That was, it's not as easy as it sounds. And then we have a, a lady, I don't know if she's here this morning, Miss Warren, if Miss Warren is here, she works at Advent uh, here, our local Advent hospital, and by herself, I've met her a couple of years ago when she did this. I want this to be a challenge to you, because some of you are like, oh, I don't have anything to do, Pastor Scott. Miss Warren starts in July, and she starts packing shoeboxes. 
She packed 600 herself, <laughs> dropped them off. I would, uh, I dropped the mic at this point, but it would throw off the sound, guys. So, so here's the deal. We have 172 cases so far. What you see, 172. We had 192 last year. We're not done yet because all afternoon, Miss Tina, wave your hand, Miss Tina. Miss Tina organized this this year and put it together. Thank you, Miss Tina. I know we're taking longer than normal. Miss Tina will be here uh, all afternoon until 3 o'clock. And she was here with all the volunteers this week accepting the shoeboxes. So last year, let me tell you what we did last year. We collected 2,907 shoeboxes last year. So far this year, we're at 2,612. So we're not quite there yet, but we expect to be beyond that this year because we'll be here the rest of the afternoon receiving those shoeboxes. And again, it's about a blessing. It's about blessing others, right? We are so blessed in our country that we would send these shoeboxes abroad. So a little later today, um, before we leave, if you would just take a time to pray over these shoeboxes, just yourself. Maybe we could do that corporately in a little while, we're not sure, but just take time. Before you leave today, make sure you look at one of the shoeboxes and you pray for the child that that's going to impact. It's a powerful thing, the gospel of Christ. Would you stand, stand with me? Stand with me. Look at somebody around you, and I want you to find at least two people and tell them what you're thankful for this morning.
be seated. Church, before we come to our time of offering, this morning around the world, there are people, churches praying all around the world for Israel and the release of the hostages. And I was asked more than 10 days ago if we would also participate in praying for Israel, joining with brothers and sisters around the world. It has only been 52 days since they experienced the greatest loss of life known in Jewish history since the Holocaust. How long did it take the world to turn against them? Less than 40. Less than 40 days. To put it into our perspective, it would be as if 37,000 Americans were all wiped off in one day. That puts it in our population and percentage-wise what it would be like. We destroyed two countries for 20 years when we lost a little over 3,000 lives. I cannot imagine if 37,000 Americans had been killed. And yet there were over 30. There were. 1,400 people that were just having breakfast or going to a concert or driving on the way to work are just worshiping as it was one of their high and holy days. Israel had not been attacked in 50 years since 1973 in Yom Kippur. And I want you to know something. Some people would say, why would you pray for Israel? It is literally the most hated people group in the history of the world. It makes no sense. It really doesn't make sense. Did you know that you wouldn't have a cell phone today without Israel? If you did, it wouldn't be able to hold the data that it does. 22% of all Nobel Prizes in science, technology, and medicine, 22%, since the Nobel Prize was instituted, has been given to Jewish people. I want to ask you, when I read this, tell me if there's a time limit. I just want to ask you, in Genesis 12, when God speaks to Abraham, he says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Time limit or not? No. I don't read a time limit. I don't hear an until. That, that's not how it works. Uh, I sent the deacons an article last night on why Israel matters. And you can ask any of the deacons for that article, why Israel matters, because I think much, mo most of us don't know why Israel matters. But I want you to know, when they came together in 1948, back in their homeland, that was fulfillment of prophecy. It was. It was fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And one day... Jesus will come again. And it is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Now, I'm not saying all Jewish people will be saved. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that God has always loved his people, and he has still not abandoned them. Just as he will not abandon you, he has not abandoned them. And we need to make sure that we as a people, what I mean as a people, I mean as Christians are still there to say we will when he says I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you we need to be blessing them and we need to be praying for their protection we need to pray that every Israeli soldier is protected as they go into these combat zones we need to pray for the release of the hostages we need to pray for the conviction of the guilty y'all what they did is as close to what the Nazis did as I, literally they made cell phone calls that are recorded about how they had just killed 10 Jewish people and they were so excited about it. That's equal to a commandant in Germany 
who gassed Jews and went home and had dinner with his family. You, you understand? It's that kind of mindset. And why on earth would anyone hate like that? I, I, it's just beyond me. It's not normal to have that kind of hatred for a people. But Israel is hated like that. So we need to pray for them. So if you want to kneel, you can come up here and kneel. If you want to just bow your head where you are. But we're going to have a time of prayer before our offering where you just lift up the nation of Israel and begin by praying for Benjamin Netanyahu and their leaders to have wisdom. Franklin Graham prayed this week with, with Benji Netanyahu. Would you pray that they would have wisdom and discernment? And then pray for their soldiers. These are all young men and young women. Many of them aren't, aren't 25 years old. Would you pray for their protection and that God would just protect these young people? They didn't ask for this. They didn't want to go to war. This was not in their plans. They've been pulled out of school. They've had to leave their families. Would you just pray that God would place a hedge of protection over all these young men and women? For the over 200 hostages, they found two more this week that had been killed. Would you pray that God would protect them? So many are children. There's a good number that are Americans. Would you pray that God would protect the hostages? Would you pray that those who have fostered this hate would be found? All of those in this terrorist organization, that they would be found and brought to justice. Everyone that's a leader in Hamas and all those who are funding it, would that all be found out? Just say, God, would you bring your justice down on those who have committed these crimes. Lastly, would you pray for the children, the children of Israel, and I think about all the Christians in Gaza. There's thousands and thousands of Christians, a persecuted minority, would you pray that they would not hate? Would you pray that none of the children would be taught to hate? Not in Gaza, not in Israel. And that God would somehow spare the Christians in Gaza and make them a strong body as they are in this time of desperate need. Pray for the Christians that God would provide food and water and shelter. The innocent always suffer with the guilty. It's always been true. And there are innocent children in Gaza, just as there are in Israel. Lord God, have your mercy upon the innocent and provide and protect the children. And Lord, we do pray for Israel. We know that you still want to bless them and you want to bless those that bless them and so Lord may America always stand on Israel's side and may we as a Christian church throughout America always stand on the side of Israel Lord you protect them we know that they are a persecuted minority the only democracy in all the Middle East and yet Lord they are always always on edge and they are hated unreasonably. So, Lord God, I pray that you would help us to never be on the side of hate. Lord, forgive us.
forgive us when even some of our own politicians have called for the destruction of Israel. Please forgive us, Lord, and have mercy on us. Lord, for all of our college campuses where people have protested against Israel, Father, when they didn't ask for this and they didn't look for a war, we pray that you would have mercy upon us and that they would seek you and find you. And Lord, we pray even now for Israel that your light, Lord, the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the only true Messiah, that, Lord, you as the Messiah would reveal yourself to Israel, that they would know Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, thank you that the leaders don't shun away from prayer from Christians. As, Lord, we believe in the same God but we know that you have already made the perfect sacrifice, the final sacrifice in your one and only son, Jesus. And Lord, we pray that they would know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, if you would, ask the Lord to bless all of our giving, to bless our giving as we are a blessing around the world. Thank the Lord. We have a Baptist village in Tel Aviv and we are taking in refugees and our church has already sent $40,000 to provide blankets and beds and air conditioning and heat. Thank the Lord for what we've been able to do. Lord, help us to always be generous givers as we give back to you. Lord, we're reminded always that you're the great giver for God so loved the world that he gave. Lord, as some of our people have reminded me throughout the years, we can never outgive you. So, Lord, help us to always be faithful to give back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, you may take the offering.
prophecies fulfilled. signs of the times they're appearing everywhere I can almost hear the Father as he says son get your children at the midnight cry church. Oh, Lord Jesus, we are so grateful this morning because you're coming again. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the promise of the second coming, that you are not done with us. Lord Jesus, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, oh, we'll be changed. We'll be changed, and we'll meet you in the air. And Lord, the verse will come true that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, Lord Jesus, we know you're Lord. Help us to live like it even today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Oh, well, welcome home, everyone. It's so good to see you today. I'm so glad you're here, and what a blessing it is to be together. Well, last week, we had sent 46 to Pigeon Forge, and I believe most of them came back. Did you bring them all back, Larry? Okay, brought them all back. So last week, we had that. Well, listen, nothing like this has ever happened before. So church, the Lord is up to something. Stand up, Colton. Come here real quick. Actually, come on up here real quick. Okay, church, I am so excited to tell you this because the most that we have ever had in the history of our church in youth, in youth, is 103 or 104. And that was always on a Wednesday night before revival, uh, before revival service. This last Wednesday night... We had friends giving. If you have food, they will come. <laughs> That's kind of a Baptist rule. If you have food, they will come. But it takes a lot of work from your leader to make that happen, okay? And thank you for everyone who cooked. There was a lot of y'all. I heard, hey, I have heard a young man named Casey. He's sitting right up there, and he did 
a smoked peach cobbler in a, in, a, in a cast iron skillet that was like this big around. I had a bite of it. Oh, brother, Jesus is coming. <laughs> oh, Casey, my goodness. And for all the rest of you that cooked, I'm proud of you. Thank you. But Casey, I love that peach cobbler, brother. And, Boston butt. and, and he did that too? Okay, I'm not saying that out loud, but anyway. Uh, so any, anyway, uh, Casey can cook is all I'm saying. But Colton, listen to this, 16 laborers, 16 of you volunteered to come and help serve, and 115 young people Wednesday night. 115. Thank you, Colton. 115. Church, nothing like this has ever happened before. 115 kids. So we send 46 senior adults away, and we had 115. And here's another miracle. Richard Copeland sitting right here. We're, we're glad you're here. Last Sunday morning, he was in ICU, and here he sits today. And so uh, now some of you may think that we're a little Pentecostal here. I want you to know I just believe the Bible. And I believe that God still heals. His name is the great physician. Just like I didn't see a time limit on the blessing from Abraham, I don't see a time limit where God stops healing and where all of a sudden it only happens for Pentecostals. I want you to know God still heals. He does. And so, Richard, we're glad you're here. Still praying for Dakota's mom, Debbie. Uh, and, and so many others. A lot of our young people we've needed to pray for this week. Uh, Jericho and Abby and Julia Bailey. We've had a lot going on with our kids this week, and we need to continue to pray for all of these families and that God would just be with each one of them. Well, three Sundays ago, it's actually just it's been only about 15 days, but three Sundays ago, I've mentioned to you, I've been reading in the Chronological Bible, and I couldn't get away because the Chronological Bible put it all there together for us. Three words that were in all four Gospels, and it was, they crucified him. And, and I preached that. And then, same, the next week in our readings, again, there was three little words that I just couldn't get away from, and it was, he is risen. And that was in the next week's readings. And so I preached on that last week. And I thought, if we've gone through the crucifixion and we've gone through he is risen, then we just need to go ahead and get to the real joy of it for us in so many ways. And so this isn't out of the chronological Bible. I continue, continue to read, y'all. I'm going to finish the whole Bible in one year. It'll be my first time in my whole life I've ever done that. Now, I've read through the Bible many times, but never in one year. I encourage you, if you've not been reading, I'm a few days behind because of the Florida Baptist Convention. It nearly killed me. It, it, it was wonderful. We were all unified. Don't misunderstand me. It was just like we were there for 17 hours. That's just, that's just, if you, for those of you who think I preach too long, you have no idea. Okay, so you just need to know I have suffered long this week. For you. Now, great music, great preaching, but how many preachers can you really listen to in one day? 17 hours, I found the limit. That's it. 17 hours and I'm done. I, I found out where, it, where the max is. I could hardly walk going out of the room, but I made it. I made it. So today, if we want to just go ahead and get to the Jubilee celebration, let's get to the Jubilee celebration. If we've done, he is risen. Let's just move on into the future, and that is, he is coming. He is coming, he is coming, he is coming. And it is so exciting to realize that Jesus is coming again soon. So I, I want us this morning, I, I, I just, I, I, I'm going to skip that sermon. Just go ahead and let's get there, okay? Take your Bible and turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I just skipped like two pages of sermons. But go ahead and get there, because I'm just all excited. You, you know, this is incredible to realize. Jesus is coming again. He's coming again. So let's all stand in honor of God's Word. We'll begin in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verse 13. It's right after the General Electric Power Company. 
if you're wondering where that is. It's Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Boom, 1 Thessalonians, there you are. And so we'll begin in verse 13. Old King James always tickled me right here because it depended upon where you put the comma as to how it sounded. Old King James says, I wouldn't have you ignorant, brethren. <laughs> That's one way of saying it. You'll just think about that on your way home. <laughs> and so New King James, it, hopefully I won't come across so bad, and it's like this. I, would, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Now, what does fallen asleep there mean? They've died. It's the same word that Jesus used about Lazarus. It's funny. Jesus said, he's fallen asleep, and the disciples said, well, then he'll get better. And finally, he's like, he's dead, guys. I'm trying to tell you. He's dead. Oh, well, maybe he won't get better from that. I don't know. Can you imagine the conversation afterwards? So, concerning those who have fallen asleep, it means you've died lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Now, he doesn't say that Christians don't sorrow there. We do sorrow, but we don't sorrow like others who have no hope. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's my last two weeks sermons, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief you are all sons of light and sons of the day we are not of the night nor of darkness therefore let us not sleep as others do but let us watch and be sober for those who sleep sleep at night and those who get drunk are drunk at night but let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation for God did not appoint us to wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. May God's word not come back void. You may be seated. See, the Lord Jesus taught from the very beginning that there's a second coming. Not just his ascension into heaven, but a second coming. It goes all the way back. You can look at it in John 14. In John 14, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so Jesus is telling us throughout his ministry that he's going to come again. There's one question that the apostles ask. You can look at it. It's found in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, the apostles are getting ready for Jesus to go into heaven, and they don't know he's going into heaven. And, and so Jesus is walking out with them to the Mount of Olives, and they ask him one question. They see the risen Lord. He's already conquered the cross. He's already conquered the grave. And they're like, okay, now it's time. You conquer the Romans. They're still thinking about temporal things. You've already conquered death. You've conquered the grave. Just go ahead. Get them, Jesus. And that's what they're wanting. And so they ask Jesus the question. And they say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Get them. Restore the kingdom of Israel. And you know what? He didn't even answer the question 
What he said to them was, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. And then he moves right on to the Holy Spirit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He doesn't really answer the question. He just says to them, it's not for you to know. And he moves right on. And then Jesus ascends, same conversation, right in front of them into heaven. And they're standing, watching as he goes up and disappears in the clouds. And it literally takes some angels to come and say, this same Jesus who you saw go up, will come down the same way, in like manner. The same Jesus that you saw go up, he's still going to come back. He's going to come back one day. And so from beginning to end, we're told that Jesus is coming again. He's coming again. And we need to know it and believe it and understand it, that Jesus Christ is coming again. Now, when we think of the second coming... There's so many words that we use that you really aren't going to find in the Bible, like second coming. If I tell you, look up all the places where it says second coming, you're not going to find that. That's not how it refers to it. It refers to it as he's coming, he appeared, and then uh, there's actually there's three words, and one of them you know very well because in English it translates the apocalypse. Apocalypsa is the Greek word, and it's the book of Revelation and how Jesus is coming. And so there, there's three words in Greek that are used for Jesus' second coming. Parousia is one of them. It means that he appeared. It was actually used in Greek uh, language for the coming of a dignitary, the coming of a king, and that's how they used it. He, the king came in. Well, that's parousia. That, that, that's how Jesus is coming. And, and the other one is, uh, we get our English word epiphany from it. Epiphany. And it means to make an appearance. We have uh, the epiphany. Jesus came at the birth uh, the birth narrative, and, and you've heard of that your whole life. You just didn't know it's literally a Greek word. And, and so those are the three words used talking about Jesus' second coming. And so I, I want you to look one other place. Look at what he has to say in Matthew. I'm jumping ahead of my sermon. Sorry, Paul. I know I'm wreaking havoc up there. But anyway, in, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, Jesus is talking, and Jesus is talking about when he's going to come again. And here's what he says. The sign, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Well, why would everybody mourn if Jesus comes again? I will tell you why. It means judgment is sure. There's a whole lot of people who believe a little bit about Jesus but they don't want saving faith. They just know he was born of a virgin. They know he died on a cross. They even know he rose from the dead. And many of them know that Jesus is coming again, and you're related to tons of them. You're related to them. I am too. We've all got extended family that we know their name is most likely not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They know enough to be dangerous. And if Jesus comes up and we're all gone, they will know what happened. They will know. And they will mourn because they missed out. They missed out. They'll be like, oh, they were right. They were right. And, and so here's what he says. All the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Listen, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, they're all going to cover it live. I guarantee you there will be cell phone coverage of this. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. It always drives me crazy when people say that there's no instruments in the New Testament. What book are they reading? And they may say, well, there's no piano. Well, of course there's not a piano, but trumpets every Sunday would just blow your hair off. I mean, come on. 
It's good occasionally, but can you imagine every week, nothing but trumpets? So anyway, he'll send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. You know what that means? We're all out of here. If you're a believer in Christ, you're out of here. I don't care your denomination. So what if you were an assembly of God, Colton? So what? So, so what if you were Methodist? So what if you were Presbyterian? That's not what he's going after. He's not coming for your denomination. By the way, in all the denominations and in every church, there will be people left. I don't care what denomination, there'll be people left that don't get to go. Every denomination, because Jesus said there's always tares with the wheat. There's always those who aren't believers in the church. And so they'll all, listen, can you imagine showing up that day and there's like only four of you for church and you go, oh goodness, it really did happen. Can you imagine? I mean, what, how awful, what will you do? What will you do that day that you show up and there's only like a few of you here? And by the way, the preacher, this one anyway, he's out of here. Okay, so <laughs> I, I'm not preaching that Sunday. No, I, I'm gone. And so skip on down to verse 36. But, on, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as, of, as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. And so, and so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill are sitting at their computers and one will be taken and the other left watch therefore for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming but know this that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into therefore you also be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect so let me tell you the purpose of Jesus telling you about the second coming over and over and over. He gave you the purpose right there. He gave you the purpose in the last verse, verse 44. You also be ready. Be ready. The reason Jesus tells us over and over and over and all the apostles that wrote is not so that we would just have faith in the second coming. It's so that we are ready. So that we're ready. That's the purpose of you knowing about the second coming. So the real question for you today, if there is one question for you, it's this. Are you ready? Now, I'm not talking about for those that used to, I remember as a teenager thinking, I'm not ready. I want to get married. I might want to even have children one day. Some days I liked them, not every day. <laughs> and so I, I wasn't ready because I wanted to live some life. That's the wrong way to think about it. It's not, are you ready because you want to live some life? I think all of us want to live life. Who, who doesn't want to live life? Only if you're in depression do you not want to live life, and then you need some medicine. Okay, so we, we, we all want to live life. So then the question really is, not if there's more things you want to do, but are you ready spiritually? If Jesus showed up, are you on the escalator going up? Are you ready to go up? If Jesus showed up, because if you're not, or you're wondering if you would be, you need to get it answered. I'm not asking you, have you been baptized? That's not what I said. That's where some of you went. You immediately said, well, I've been baptized. That's not, what, that's not the question. The question is, are you ready spiritually to go meet Jesus? Some of you said in your mind, you said, well, the pastor doesn't know how much I've tithed. That was not the question. 
That was not the question. Are you basing your salvation on your works? That's what it sounds like. If you're answering that way, the question is, are you ready? Not, what have you done to justify yourself? They're two completely different questions. It's spiritually, are you ready? Not, do you have more things that you would like to do? Yes, there's all, all of us have more things that we'd like to do. Okay, yes. Well, you know, I want to go see the Grand Canyon and go on a cruise. But, but that's not the, the right answer. It, it's, can I do without that? Yes. I am ready spiritually to meet Jesus. Amen. Does it mean I'm perfect? Listen. All of us, the scripture says, fall in many ways. Some of you have had a bad week this week. And you've lost your temper. You've said things you shouldn't have said. Or you've seen things you shouldn't have seen. Have you asked the Lord to forgive you? And if you have, then you can say, I'm not where I want to be, but I am ready. See, Bottom line is, most of us, most days, aren't where we want to be. I mean, truth be told, all of us have areas in our life, and and we're not where we want to be. But are we ready to meet Jesus? Doesn't mean you're always on a spiritual high. You cannot grow on the mountaintop. There's no fertilizer up there. Things don't grow up there. Have you noticed at the tops of mountains, nothing grows? You grow down in the valley, and that's where the hard times come. And it's where you don't always live the way you want to live, and you don't always act the way you want to act, and you don't always say what you want to say or what you even should say. But the truth is, that's where we grow And that's where we're constantly in the mode of repentance, where we're asking God for forgiveness and we're saying, please deal with me according to your mercy. I confess this to the Lord. You make it right and you move forward to the next day. To the next day. And to the next day. Oh, Jesus had so much to say about the second coming. I, it's, it's not in my sermon, but we got to go there. Colossians, General Electric Power Company. Y'all know where that is? Go to Colossians. It's right before Thessalonians. It's the last little book before Thessalonians. Now, this is one of the best passages on being ready. It answers Jesus' question on why you have so much information concerning the second coming. Why do you need to be ready? And here's what he says. I love this. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 will begin in verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Now let me tell you, here when he says when you were raised with Christ, it's like he's referring to your baptism. In other words... You've been dead and buried in a watery grave, and you've been raised to walk in a new life with him. That's what it's referring to. It's not that the baptism saves you. He's saying that you've been raised up because what are you before you're a Christian? You're dead. And then once you're dead, he brings you to life. You've been raised to walk in Christ. Okay, so that's what he's referring to here in Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. You've been raised... to to walk with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. So we're to seek things that are above. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Now, let me help you with this. Every one of you still have to do earthly things. You have to eat, you have to wash your clothes, you have to go to to your work, you have to uh, uh, um, eat... (laughs) Uh, you know, we, we've got to eat. <laughs> we've got to do all these earthly things. And it is hard sometimes to constantly try to set your mind on things above. You know what helps that? If you bless your food before you eat. You're thanking God in that moment, and you're setting your mind on earthly things. Before every doctor's appointment, you ought to pray and say, God, help me with this doctor's appointment, whatever it is. I don't care if they're just taking blood. Tell, ask them to... Lord, help them not to bruise me. You know, and if there's anything there, help them to find it. You know, you can pray those kind of prayers. Before every doctor's appointment, uh, it's setting your mind on earthly things. Before you go to work every day, you need to pray and ask God to protect you, to give you wisdom. If you work with the public, you need lots of wisdom. 
lots of wisdom. Lord, help me with, with the public. If you deal with clients, Lord, help me with my clients. Help me with my patients. Help me, with, as, even as a bank teller, Lord, help me to deal with every customer appropriately. Help me not to count out any money wrong. You know, I mean, you can pray before you ever get there. What it's doing is it's setting your mind on things above. Because you're recognizing no matter your job, for all of you who are retired and you're doing family events this week, you need to be prayed up. You do. Lord, Lord, help me, help me, help me to be able to deal with the in-laws, the outlaws, and in the, all the in-betweens. You need to be pr prayed up. Now, <laughs> some of y'all come from such godly families. I, I need to go to your, your holiday sometime. But I just sit back in awe. Look at all this. They're all just happy in Jesus. <laughs> oh, man, you're so blessed and you don't even know it. So, <laughs> oh, so many good stories. So anyway, I will be prayed up when I get home. You know, going to see mom and dad this week, 80 and 84. We're, we're going to be prayed up. And, and so uh, we'll, be, we'll be ready with, with bazookas if necessary in the name of the Lord you know in the name of the Lord we greet you so verse 3 of Colossians for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God okay my life I don't have something I can show you I'm going to try this my life hidden in Christ with God. Did you, did you understand what I just did? My life hidden with Christ in God. I, I was just using a little illustration to be hidden for me to be in Christ with God is a beautiful illustration about how God just wraps his self around us in every way and so that we can follow him. And then he moves into the be ready part. So he's just talked about the death, uh, crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus raised with Christ. You see that in verse 1? And then, verse 4, when Christ who appears, when Christ who is our life appears, that's the second coming, folks, right there. Do, do you see it? When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's the second coming. And then he tells us how to be ready. So how are you to be ready for the second coming? Verse 5, therefore put to death your members which are on earth. And he begins to list them. What do you need to put to death? Number one, fornication. Do you know what that is? That's if you sleep with somebody and you're not married before you get married. In other words, you're to wait on the person God has for you. Not a popular message today, I know, but it's, it's true from the Word of God. So all you young men and young women, now let me help you. You're to wait on who God has for you. Let me help you, old men and old women. If you've lost your spouse, you're to wait. You don't have a license. You can say, well, I got married once, now I'm free. It doesn't mean free to do whatever you want to do. Oh, my goodness. That's why they've got problems at the villages. You, I said that out loud, didn't I? So, I'm just telling you what the Word says right there. The way I used to say it to teenagers was, keep your clothes on. Fornication, right there. Number two, he says, how are you ready? Uncleanness. Uncleanness, that's also sexual in nature. You can do a whole lot of things, as we have found out through the years, and not, as young people say, go all the way. you got to be clean. you you got to protect yourself. Passion, well, I'm not even going to go there. Evil desires, it's everywhere. Covetousness. Covetousness is basically greedy, and what it means is you see something that you like and you want it. That, that's what it means. 
You see something somebody else has, and you want it. It, it, Y'all, how many people, when one kid gets the latest gadget today, then all the kids feel like they got to get that gadget? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, that's covetousness when you want theirs. And what does he say about that? He says covetousness, greediness, is idolatry. And we know from the Bible that if you're an idolater, you are, you are definitely not ready. You are not going to heaven. He, he says that in the Word. And so if, if you've got another God besides the Lord Jesus, you are not ready for the second coming. And if your covetousness, if you're coveting, that means greed, that means you're an idol worshiper. That's scary, isn't it? It's right there before all of us. And by the way, you don't have to have an idol to bow down to to be an idol worshiper. That, that's letting us know that right there. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. All of us have walked in these things. But now you yourselves are to put off all these things. And what else are we to put off? Anger. We're to put off anger. We're to put off wrath. Wrath is a step beyond anger. That's when you go mashugana. Wrath is like you lose your mind crazy, your head spins around three times, and all the kids say, get out of mama's way. (laughs) Not that my wife has ever done that. I didn't mean that, baby. But anyway, but y'all know about mashugana, right? It's a good Yiddish word. I'll teach you one day. And so... Uh, So anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. We're to get rid of filthy language out of your mouth. And so do not lie to one another. He's telling us how to be ready for the second coming. Uh, Don't lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And so that is how we get ready for the second coming. Jesus told us to be ready. Paul tells us how to be ready. And the question is, are you ready? Are you ready because the trumpet will sound? And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. We shall all be changed. So it's been nearly 2,000 years since Christ's first coming, since his ascension into glory. And I want you to know his second coming is certain. There is no doubt. There is no prophecy that has ever been prophesied in this book that has not proved true. There are still more to fulfill than have been fulfilled. And I want you to know, if he's already fulfilled over 700, the last thousand is no problem for him. Paul said the second coming is his words in Philippians chapter 3 at hand. The first generation of believers knew that Jesus could come back at any moment. If you believe the temple has to be rebuilt for Jesus and his second coming, you're wrong. Nothing else has to happen for Jesus to come back. If you're thinking that, you're looking for a license or an excuse to live life the way you want to live it. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for, I want to do it my way, and then it'll be too late. I don't want to scare you to death this morning, but I had rather scare you into heaven than lull you to sleep into hell. And I want you to know Jesus is coming. He's coming again. And when he comes back, he will restore the balance of the scales of justice. Every one of you who've ever been wronged on anything, I want you to know he'll set it right. It always encourages me. I've dealt with so much molestation through the years. I want you to know when Jesus balances the scales, he will deal with them. It's not for the victim to have to deal with it. Jesus will deal with it. You put them in Jesus' hands, he will deal with them. 
And I want you to know his kingdom will be established and he will be in his rightful place as he is now, as King of kings and Lord of lords. It's not a question on whether or not every knee will bow and every tongue confess. It is only a matter of when. Only a matter of when. And Jesus will have every tongue confess. And it will include yours. It will be either willingly or unwillingly. Are you willing to confess him as your Lord now? Before he makes you to? I want you to know it's much better to do it willingly than unwillingly. Let's all stand. Lord, I pray in this moment that you would help us all to be ready. To be ready for your second coming. Because, Lord, it is at hand, as your word says. There's nothing to delay your coming. The only reason you to delay is because of mercy and grace. Because you're allowing more to enter the kingdom. You're allowing many more to be saved, even today, as Christians worship all the way around the globe, hour by hour. And, Lord, soon they'll be worshiping in Texas, and then they'll be worshiping in Salt Lake City, and in Nevada and then they'll be worshiping in California and then they'll be worshiping in Hawaii and it'll go all the way around the globe Lord as Christians bow the knee to you and say Jesus Christ is Lord Lord thank you that today thousands more will enter the kingdom and we pray Father that some would even be here here in Mount Dora so Lord God is there someone you're calling that's not been ready but they want to be ready now they want to say, Jesus is my Lord. Oh, Lord, you call them out that today they may know Jesus is Lord. Lord, if there's others who want to join this church, follow through with believers' baptism like Ken and Julie, I pray that they would come forward even now, Lord. You help us to step out by faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You come. The gift you come. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For Everybody in this room can't be ready. We're not all ready for Jesus to come, and I know it. But I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you, and I want you to know that even when we tell Jesus we're not ready, He loves you. I've said many years, He loves you so much, but He loves us too much to leave us the way He finds us. Miss Jan, if you'll step up here. This is Jan Workmaster, and I just fell in love with her last year in Pigeon Forge. It's okay, I was, my wife was with me. <laughs> Don't tell that. 
Miss Jan is having cancer surgery in the morning. And I know that if God's people pray, God will work and take care of her. And uh, Miss Nancy, it's the same kind of surgery you had and Debbie had. And, and I, I want to just lift her up. And then uh, also there's so many in our church family that's going through much, so much. Vlad and his family are going through a lot. Their little girl, Abby, and Julia Bailey's, and Jericho, and so many of our kids have been in the hospital this week. Abby's still there. But I want us to close today, if you would. Richard, you believe in miracles. You know, you know. He was in ICU last week, and there he stands. So uh, we want to lift up Miss Jan and just pray God's healing power on her. So right where you are, would you pray for Miss Jan Workmaster? Pray that God would heal her. Pray that he would remove the cancer. Pray that the doctors would know what to do and how to do it. Pray that they'd know what treatment to give. And then ask for the great physician to attend to her. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're the great physician. And we ask that you would just attend to Miss Jan Workmaster in every way. And you would be with her and protect her. And Lord, that you would kill every cancer cell, remove these cancer cells, deliver her. Oh, Lord God, we ask for deliverance. And we're just so grateful that you hear our prayers. We pray for Vlad and Svetlana and their whole family. We pray for Jericho and John and Bethany and their whole family. We pray for Julia Bailey and so thankful, Father, for that family that Paul and Michelle just continue to work there. Lord, all the families that are going through so much, we pray for Dakota's mom, Debbie. Lord, we still know that you're the great physician and you're on your throne and nothing has rattled you. So we ask, Father, that you would give Miss Jan the peace that passes all understanding, that she would have the peace of the Lord as she faces this battle. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Love you, sister. Love you. Well, church, I, I look so far. I want you to also, I forgot to mention my own mom. My mom is having a nerve block tomorrow. She has got terrible leg pain. What do they call that? Sciatic nerve pain. And she can hardly walk. And here we are all going home. So she's going to have a nerve block tomorrow if you'd pray for her. And then um, my wife wants to meet with everybody that has ever worked hospitality here at the church. Or if you've ever worked in any kitchen and willing to do it again, and all those people who have tested for hospitality, if you'd meet right over here in this section, right here where, where uh, Miss Barbara Cam is, that'll, that'll work good. She's going to meet with y'all just briefly for a moment. And I think I'm leaving out one more thing. I am. Miss Shirley, Miss Little Shirley right here, wave your hand. She's going to be not, yeah, you. She's going to be 95 Tuesday. Can you believe that? Right here. Now, she can turn around to Sylvia and say, listen here, young girl. But Bruce can go up to her and say, now listen here, young woman, because Bruce is 99. He'll be 100 his birthday. So what a, what a blessing. But, but Miss Shirley, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. Well, let's close with a word of prayer. And if I've missed something, and I probably have, know that I love you and I didn't do it intentionally. I just can't remember everything in the last 30 seconds. So let's pray. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be all glory and power, majesty and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Be blessed, church.